Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keynes of GoldSilverPros.com. It is Monday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, <laughs> December 5th, 2023. Had to get my days right. This is your weekly market wrap up, which as you notice, we moved to Tuesday. It's just easier for me to put it on this day. We're going to look back at what's happened in the economy the last week. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. We're going to talk about a couple of big stories. And then we're going to focus probably the last half of this report on what happened in gold. Uh, over the weekend, we had a record open, then a big crash yesterday. I'll explain using data exactly how that happened. Uh, we won't have the culprits as usual till a week from now when the new COT report comes out, but I'm pretty sure we know who it's going to be. But you can definitely see in the charts who caused it. We'll go over all of that, and then I'll give a really just really tight, quick preview over what is going to happen uh, when we get to the cryptocurrency system, the new central bank digital currency system. I'm going to start on that on Thursday with my first video on that. I think you guys will be really interested. We've got a lot of data research, white paper type stuff, and then I'll kind of explain where uh, I think it's going, in my opinion. We're going to do a deep dive on that. I've been promising that for a while. Uh, just you know, had to get to the point where I had the, the bandwidth to do that. All right, jumping right into the economic calendar, the economic data. Uh, consumer confidence. Uh, in the last week, that report had it rising to 102 from a 99.1. And consumers are confident because they think the economy is going to rebound. But overall, they're grumpy because of the labor market. We'll get into the labor market here in a moment. They do also worry about inflation persisting. Higher prices are definitely harming people. Uh, the GDP prints at 5.2% up from 4.9% last time. I, uh, frankly, I don't believe this number. But that's what's being reported, so I'll go ahead and report it. Um, but we'll see why in the data, why GDP is up 5.2%. Most of it's consumer spending. We know a lot of consumers are buy now, pay later plans. They're not. They're actually living on credit, but not only credit cards. They're now moving that into like department stores and other types of retail stores who are now taking on credit because they need to keep sales up. And instead of selling people at cash or check or credit card, consumers who don't have credit card room are doing buy now, pay later. And... That's endemic among the younger populations. The younger populations are the highest percentage of buy now, pay later plans. This is not a good sign. People don't have money. They're still spending. So even though GDP is up, it's up mostly on credit. And this is going to, uh, we're going to pay the piper later on that because this is not only are we buying stuff, but we're buying it on interest. So we're buying stuff that's going to be more expensive. And if we can't pay it back now, if we can't pay it now, how are we going to pay it later when we're heading into an economic recession? This is another reason why when we head into a recession. A lot of the banks and now retailers who are now extending credit are going to be in trouble. Business expansion is up only 2.4%. It's relatively modest. There was some business expansion. It's more muted. I think businesses are more seeing, uh, are doing a better job of seeing inflation and they're seeing the weakness overall in sales. And so uh, they're expanding a little bit, but they're being very cautious about how they do it. The most spending came from government. So one of the reasons why I don't believe the GDP is expansionary is because government is not expansionary. Government is very expensive. It uh, draws down. Uh, it causes us to run deficits and it draws down uh, um, on further production. It's not government. It's not productive, like uh, building new technology equipment, you know, plants, property equipment, that type of thing. PP need. So government is up the most business is uh, up the least and consumers are living on credit. That's a true picture of why GDP is up. So this GDP is false, not in that the numbers are are blatant lie, but that the numbers are not telling what's going on and why it's up. And I think if you see what's going on with government expansion, businesses pulling back, consumers living on credit, you can say this is not sustainable. In fact, here's a quote uh, from Chief Economist Gregory Daco of EY Parthenon. Evidence of economic strength over the summer could mislead some to assume the economy is on a strong trajectory. It is not. Uh, employment jobless claims up to 218K. Personal income is also down to a 0.2% increase from 0.4. So wages aren't rising. Personal income overall is not rising a lot, uh, certainly not to keep up with inflation. Manufacturing and construction about dead even on the last month. They haven't moved anywhere overall. And new home sales are down. This is a warning because new home sales were up. Why? You could get a new home because people that had existing homes weren't selling because they didn't want to sell their three and four and five percent mortgages for an eight and nine percent mortgage. And the and, and that's the majority of homes are existing homes. New homes are a smaller percentage of homes in the market because they're new, obviously. And so, but people were buying those because a lot of home builders were extending uh, good payment terms, uh, giving incentives. 
People, you know, had the money to get into them. They had some spending money. Well, that's down. And that's down for the first time in a while. That had been the only part of home sales expanding. And now that's starting to contract because people can't afford it. Why? Well, if you think about buy now, pay later, if people can't afford to buy retail goods, how are they going to afford to buy homes at elevated interest rates? It's a much bigger purchase. Auto sales are already down. We've seen reports from some of the big automakers in the U.S. are suffering right now. They've got a glut of inventory. Prices are coming down. There are good deals out there if you're going to buy an automobile. Uh, even though the prices are high, the deals, relatively speaking, are pretty good. Um, but new, new, the other big purchase, new home sales are now down, and that's an issue. All right, on to markets. Stocks were mixed back in the last week. The Dow Jones is up 1.6% after being one of the poorest performing indicators for 2023, uh, bested only by the Russell 2000, which is down the most. But last week, it had a, an up week, which is nice. It's still not up for the year, but it's nice to see an up week. The S&P 500 was down about half a percent, a little over half a percent, and NASDAQ led the trailers down 1.1%. Rates are falling in the bond market. The bond market is saying immediate term risk is lowered just a little bit. I think they're looking at some of this data that we're talking about and thinking things are okay. But I think um, the bond rates rose a lot based on uh, Fed trajectory and what the Fed said. And I now, now I think we can see that the Fed being a little bit more hawkish, um, the bond rates should start to mediate and probably go back up in 2023. I don't or in 2024. I don't think they'll happen in 2023. Crypto market is surging. Bitcoin surges over $4,300 just in the last calendar week. It's up over 42,000 at the time that I'm doing this video. Ethereum is also up 9.5%. It's actually up as a percentage slightly higher than Bitcoin, which is a first in a while. Bitcoin had led the rally. I think Ethereum is catching up. Uh, BNB, which is the Binance tradable token, is up 0.59%. Not a lot. And Solana is up 8.5%. Those are the top risers in the top uh, five to six uh, tradable cryptos at the moment, according to Coin Market Cap. There you go. That's your report on the markets. We're going to talk a little bit about stories, and then I'm going to dive into gold and silver. Uh, and I'm actually going to share some of these stories. I'm going to report uh, the stories I have are pretty much straight from Zero Hedge and the New York Times. Um, usually, I have a lot of variety in, in my sources, but these are so important. I'm just going to focus on these. I'm going to talk a little bit about the war. I'm going to explain why I'm talking about the war. The war is not the most popular topic, especially when I put it on X or Twitter. People don't like when I talk about this. I haven't taken sides in this debate. I'm not saying I'm pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian or pro certainly not pro-Hamas, you know, indeed a terrorist organization, which everybody says it is. Um, I'm not pro any of those things. And I've criticized the war from the standpoint of loss of life. I'm just pro-life in this case. But I'm also pro the U.S. not getting into every every other possible type of negative situation uh, that it can get into with regards to the war. At the end of the day, I'm not saying I'm I'm pro anything, uh, but I think there's an article here which basically outlines how I feel about the war. And it's just dangerous that we're involved in this war at this particular time, especially with how it's going. So um, Pentagon chief unleashes a controversial statement and right off of Zero Hedge, as reported yesterday, uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has raised eyebrows by saying Israel faces a strategic defeat if it doesn't reduce civilian casualties in Gaza. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza says over 15,200 mostly women and children have died in the war. And I know that that number is very controversial. Not everybody believes that number, but at the end of the day, that's the one they're putting out. And we'll show uh, a New York Times article which talks about this number as well. The White House has definitely questioned the official death count from the Palestinian side. But even by conservative estimates, civilian deaths are in multiple thousands. We'll get into this New York Times article here in a moment. Uh, Lloyd Austin focuses Saturday comments on the long-term effects of mass civilian slaughter and not only the coming global backlash, but the potential for fur further radicalizing an entire population. Quote, the center of gravity is the civilian population, and if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat, Austin said in a speech at the Reagan National Defense Forum in Simi Valley, California on Saturday. The secretary added that he has personally pushed Israel leaders to avoid civilian casualties, prevent violence to settlers in the West Bank. We will continue to press Israel to protect civilians and to ensure the robust flow of humanitarian aid, he added, according to The Hill. And I'm just going to go to the bottom of this article, and here's a quote. In this kind of fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. Uh, so, oh yeah, and essentially what he's saying, the obvious common sense, you create more Hamas and you destroy by killing civilians. And that's what I've been saying. Be careful with how you conduct this war and why is the United States necessarily so closely involved in this? I'm not saying 
that the attack on Israel, it wasn't warranted a reaction to that. I'm not saying that Israel was wrong necessarily in the way that they've uh, conducted the war in the beginning. But Netanyahu said they did a horrible job protecting civilians. Our secretary and our government's coming out saying, yeah, this is turning into a ne net negative here. You may be creating more problems in the future. And that's exactly what I said before. Why is the U.S. involved in this? Because this is going to blow up. If you add the fact that one of our destroyers uh, reportedly got attacked uh, yesterday by a rocket from a, a Houthi-controlled Yemen area, that this is blowing up into a, a much bigger uh, Middle East war. And that's not something we need right now. We don't have the money to spend on this economically, but we don't need this going on because if this continues to develop, we could be looking at not only a regional hot war, potentially going into a world war. And I'm not joking about that. I think we have to be very careful playing sides here. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not taking sides. I'm just saying we have to be careful taking sides and pouring so much resources into it. End quote. And as such, what Israel has been doing so far is nothing but dig a hole. It's deeper and deeper. And after, obviously, it's doing all this with the Pentagon weapons and support in myriad ways. So Austin's words are pretty disingenuous. But they see Israel's or unsinkable aircraft carrier in a region, so they must feel that they're stopped this act of support. It says further up in the article that we have to support Israel, but it's also saying the way Israel's doing it's not great. If you look at the New York Times article, they came out not too long ago, November 25th. Gaza civilians under Israeli barrage are being killed at an historic pace. In less than two months, more than twice as many women and children have been reported killed in Gaza. Now, Lauren Leatherby, who wrote this article for the New York Times, is taking, I think it's taking the Hamas number. She says here, look at the amount of people in this chart uh, that are being uh, killed. Most of them are women and children. Now, the numbers may be off, but I wonder if the proportion of the numbers are not off. Maybe it is a lot of women and children are being killed. Uh, as compared to men. And maybe that is a big issue, even if the overall number is not quite uh, what we expect uh, to see in a war. We expect more of the, the fighting men to be injured in this type of war. Uh, so moving on from that, uh, the other part of this article that I want to talk about, well, you see the picture here of the mass grave. This picture is circulated around social media. Again, I don't need to, to go over that too much. But there's another chart down here, which is interesting. Comparing the 2023 war, uh, and the action that's being taken in Gaza Strip to previous fighting, there's a much higher percentage of women and children being affected. And she goes on to talk about the type of bombs being used and how they're leveling apartments, universities and things, and how that's creating uh, more civilian casualties. The question is, is that basically pushing people into the arms of Hamas? And what I've said before is if you look at the demographics of the Gaza Strip, most of them were young people. They weren't baby boomers or Gen X my age. They were younger, they're millennials and, and younger than that, Gen Zers. Most of them could not have voted in Hamas. We don't know how much they supported it. There were questions about that, but we, but the question now is, and our own secretary, our own secretary is questioning this, as is the New York Times, um, or is this creating a bigger problem where you're driving people that may have not decided or may have not been pro-Hamas into Hamas's hands? And again, given the other things that are going on in the Middle East, is this going to blow up into a bigger Middle East war? And would that eventually lead to a world war? We don't know. But I'm just saying you have to be careful. And just from an economic standpoint, this is a very difficult war to fund at a time when we just funded Ukraine and they're Ukraine, Russia. Now we're doing this one at a time when the economy is not doing great. So from an economic standpoint, it's not great. All right. On to labor. Uh, I love Zero Hedges reporting on labor. They do a better job reporting on the labor reports than anyone. Uh, I always do my own deep dives. But this article is just so good. I'm just going to talk about it. You can see that. Um, it says here, with consensus expecting only a modest drop in the reported September 9.553 million job openings, what the BLS reported moments ago instead was a stunning collapse of 617,000 job openings to just 8.733 million, the lowest since March of 2021. This came out this morning at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Time and was a six sigma miss, according to the estimate of 9.3 million. So the job market is not nearly what, what the BLS is saying, and if, if you've never follow jobs before if you're new to the channel or if you need a refresher. Jobs is the most abused number in government statistics. I used to think it was inflation. I think it's jobs. I think jobs is the most abused number. They always, almost always revise it down. There have been two big revision estimates in the non-farm payrolls by the BLS in the last year, both taking it different directions. And I'm not talking revisions of just a current print number. I'm talking all the numbers. And here's an example if you look at this chart. When you look at the revisions for the last several periods, you can see we're actually negative. We were negative to the reported numbers, which means the overall job numbers that were created in the article makes this point. When the Fed was stopped hiking rates and paused for a long time, it was based upon the thought that we had this robust job market. 
Do we have a robust job market? No, we don't. It's a crap job market, which I've been saying forever. And the data is clear. And when you see the BLS revised their numbers down over and over and over again, and the Fed is on that data. See, this is the problem with government data. It causes the Fed and economists and, and the, the mainstream financial news to make wrong decisions or wrong commentary on what's actually going on. But those decisions have been made on false data. Now the real data comes out. And what is the repercussion of that going to be? It's going to be bad. And according to BLS, the largest decrease in job openings was in healthcare, finance and insurance, and real estate rental and leasing. Pay attention to this one. What have I been saying about the real estate market? People continue to tell me we need housing. Yes, we do. We need it more affordable prices. Real, I can tell you right now, real estate agents I know around here are struggling. And we're, I'm in a good part. I'm in a good metropolitan area in a growing state um, in, in a nice area of town. I have just luckily, I'm able to live in a fairly nice area of town. And real estate's not doing so great. And if you look nationally, it's not doing so great. When you see people start to lose jobs and there's less expansion, interest rates are up, prices are up. What did I say in the economic data in the beginning? Prices are up. New home sales are coming down. At the same time, jobs in real estate are falling. Some people are in this psychosis where they refuse to, to effing believe. I'm not cussing. I'm just saying effing. <laughs> um, they refuse to believe real estate can come down. Well, guess what? It's coming down. So get over yourself. I'm sorry. I mean, I love you guys, but real estate's coming down. You, you, any asset based upon the paper system is going to come down eventually in this recession. It happens in every recession. Let's just be adults about it. Um, they go on to say in Zero Hedge, the pledge and number of job openings met in October. The number of job openings was just this many, many more than the number of unemployed workers. Meaning if you take the ratio of job openings to unemployed, it dropped to 1.34, the lowest level since August 2021, and almost back to pre-COVID levels of 1.3, a far record from the 2.0 hit in early 2022. So the amount of job openings is receding. We don't have a robust job market. When I, I read an article in CNBC today that said, I don't understand we have a robust job market. Why are people so sour? It was on the Consumer Confidence Report. Why are people sour? We have the best job market in decades. No, we do not. The data is clear. Stop saying that, you idiots in the financial media. Dig deeper than the headline number in the headline chart and see the truth. And look at the revisions and report the revisions downward of the jobs. They never do this. This drives me up a wall. It's false reporting. Stop it. People quitting their jobs. You know, people quit their jobs more when there's a robust job market and they know they can go to another one and they can upgrade and increase their income or get maybe get a better job that they like. You know, maybe they go take a vacation seasonal job. Maybe they, you know, they do, they go in a travel industry. They, they do things that allow them to do it because the jobs are up. Well, the jobs are down and people quitting is down because they can't. That's another sign that the total quits is coming down. That um, total hires and quits is coming down if you look at this chart. Total hires and quits both down. That's a recessionary indicating trend. When it look how long this has been going on. This has been going on since 2022. That's almost two years of data. Down, down, not up. Look at the NFIB. Let's blow this up just a little bit. And the NFIB survey that percentage of firms with positions not able to fill has been steadily declining. It's not a robust job market. What the hell are you smoking? Are you on crack? The NFIB's measure of job openings tracks jolts openings very closely. In other words, we know. Okay, anyway, I don't need to harp on that. Uh, but that's what's going on. So that's the data. We're at about 18 minutes. I'm going to real quickly go through the gold stuff. I don't want this to be too long, about 25, 30 minutes at the most. We're going to go through the gold stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I got in the store. I got new product in the store. You guys are going to love it. It's really awesome and cool. And then I'll give just a super quick, I'm not even going to talk about it really. I'm just going to super quick preview what's coming on Thursday because I think it's really cool. Okay, go back to the presentation. Let's motor through the gold stuff. This actually is not going to take long. So what happened to gold? It gapped up by my count when I was watching it, 53, 54, but I think it was 5380 or 5480 on Sunday night. It took about 15 to 20 minutes and to open on Sunday night, which opened about 6 p.m. Uh, it opened, it gapped up about 53 bucks. It started to come down. When I went to sleep, it was still up about 28 to 30. I thought, okay, good. We're going to have a positive Monday. And then Monday was a bloodbath. Well, I said back then it had to be paper shorting. That's the only, that's the way the market works. And who's shorting? We won't know until next week when the COT data comes out from the CFTC. 
but we do know there's elevated volume. Look at this chart. Look at this right here. The volume yesterday was 412,000 contracts. It almost matched the total open interest, meaning we almost had a full daily turnover of every open contract on the COMEX. How in the hell often does that happen? Well, not very often. Okay. Not very often. And when you get these big spikes, it's almost always a down day in gold and silver. Almost always. I've been doing this for years. Almost always. Not always. But on the up days, it's usually one of these days with less contracts. And, the, and it doesn't take much, much to push it up. But on the down days, it's an absolute deluge of just massive paper shorting. We'll see when the cot report comes out. But I've seen this pattern so many times. But look at the volume. Here's the total. Total volume, 412,107. 378,224 in February. 19,000 in April. I mean, February is the new dominant contract month. We're starting to take deliveries in December, which I'll show you here in a moment. But they monkey hammered this thing. Who monkey hammered it? I'm going to say it's probably the bullion banks or the swap dealers, which I call the swamp dealers, but you can't call it until you see the cot report. So we'll look at it. When it comes out, the data always comes out a week after. It's just the way it goes, drives people crazy. Can't catch them red handed. You can, it just takes a week. And looking at the price, the price went down, uh, I'm sorry, 46.90 on the December contract and December 47.50. About 47 and a half bucks, somewhere in there, 46, 47 and a half. That's Monday's data. Look at where it was Friday. It was up 32. Thursday, it was up not, it was down nine. Wednesday, it was up seven. Tuesday, it was up 27. So Thursday and Monday basically subtracted the gains from last week. So we're back to where we were last week. No big deal. Pissed a lot of people off. Um, I think, well, I'll give you my comments on that in a moment. Let's get through the data. In gold, we've actually had some gold flow back on. Now we're net net between London, the US, and these other associated ETFs and COMEX and all these markets down about $118,000 over the last month. But look at what's happened to COMEX. There's been a net increase of 117,000. There's gold flowing back in the COMEX. And on the chart, you can see this little baby bump right there. Just little baby. Just little, now it's a drop in the bucket to what's come off the last two years. You guys see me do this chart like every single week. Okay, Rob, we've seen this chart. I know, but I do it so that you know. COMEX gold stocks. We're gonna go down to this chart, eligible versus registered. They both have fallen the last two years. That's all you need to know. What's eligible? It's the one that you could potentially train on the market, but it's not earmarked for it. It could be earmarked for something else. It could be private storage. We don't know. That's the light green. The dark green's registered. Registered means it's actually there to be traded. It's li It's what I call liquid gold, or in the case of silver, liquid silver. It's the liquidity, the dark line, the dark color. The green could be back of liquidity, but we don't know. It could be claimed by somebody else. Somebody doesn't want to give it up at that price. It, you know, CME Group came out a few years ago and said, we don't even know. It could be 50-50. It could be more. It could be less. They admit it. They don't know. So we just look at liquidity. That's the dark line. And it's gone down. But they've both gone down. The overall stocks have gone down. So, yeah, we've had a little bit of a pop uh, on the COMEX thing the last four weeks. But net-net, man, it's down big, big old time-o. Big old time-o. And I'm going to show you the deliveries we had so far in December. They've been big, just like I, like I predicted. We'll get, we get this very last tab over here we'll talk about. All right, on to silver. Silver had a big day, too. It also came down, though, not as much as a percent. I guess not as much of a, a dollar move. Um, but it had a big trading day. 119,000 buying and 142,000 open interest. Not quite the level uh, of gold, both in percentage terms and overall number of contracts, but still frothy. And remember, uh, silver trades on 5,000 ounces while gold trades on 100. So you can still have bigger numbers in silver, even though you have less overall contracts. Well, March is a dominant month for silver, not February. And you can see 2,500 contracts rolled off. They're going into futures month. But February is still the big, big dog. You haven't heard 13,000 contracts volume there. And, you know, that's still a lot. Total volume, 119,000 on right now, open interest of 123. Well, you got to add these two, but still. That's a pretty big number. Um, oh, I got to go back to gold and show you the EFPs. Uh, one thing I forgot to tell you, EFPs are where you go over to London. You trade a futures on COMEX for something in London. And it's usually either hunting gold or hunting price differences in gold and paper. But look at this. EFP, 56.43 in the February contract, 1,500 in April. People are trading all the way out to April. They're taking futures position in April and going over to London and saying, can I get the gold? In April. You don't think people want gold? Oh, people want gold. Okay, that was Monday's day. This Friday's day, the same thing. They're doing it on two contracts. <laughs> they're not, they've learned. They're not going to do it on one contract. 
hey, I can trade in April. I can trade in February. I can go try to get the goal for both of them. Will they do it in London? I don't know. 3.99.93 as of Thursday. What about Wednesday? So people are going to London trying to get the gold or they're trying to play price arbitrage, meaning or they're moving their exposure to the London market. That's another way to look at it. Sometimes you're just trading paper to move exposure from one market to another to protect a position you have elsewhere in the market. Maybe protect your existing physical position because futures can be a way to protect that. And the OTC market can be a way to, let's see if I can explain this, to have a price exposure, even though you may not want to take the physical. But I've been told by market analysts, and it says in the CME Group's website, that you also can try to get the physical. So I, I think a lot of this is physical hunting. All right, on to silver. Not as big of a trade. Some EFPs there. The EFPs in silver have not been as big as gold. You know, it's just, it's not. Um, because I think there's probably enough delivery going on. It surprises me somewhat that they're not EFPing as much. But I think that silver is a, from a price perspective, a more closely traded market between London and the United States. So the price arbitrage is a little bit less there. The price is more compressed and it's been more flat in terms of its trading range. So it doesn't surprise me there's less EFP from people trying to take a U.S. position over to a U.K. position. But there's still some. They're still hunting for silver. I mean, it's there. All right. Looking at the data, Monday's data down 95 cents. Uh, sorry, March is the big month. Um, Friday's data up 19. Thursday up 20. Same thing in silver as gold. They smashed it on Monday. I show you the data. It's boring, but I show it to you so you know what's going on. What about silver coming out of the depository? Well, net net. Total silver dropped 748,000 ounces over the last four weeks, but you saw a lot come into registered. There's been liquidity flowing into registered. Why? People want it. Remember what registered is? Well, registered's right here on silver. This is silver stocks. Registered's come down. There's not as much liquidity, but it's gone up lately. People are bringing silver in the market. Why? I don't know. Silver rose a little bit, but also there's probably been some production. There's probably been some silver sitting there waiting for it to get around 25. 24 to 25. And when it did, you see a little liquidity. That's positive for silver. There's a little bit more liquidity out there. We're not quite at a short squeeze situation. We're close when you look at this number and how much of this eligible could flow down to this green line and push it up. I don't know. There's a little bit. You saw a decrease there and an increase here. So some people may, you know, said, yeah, I've got silver and comics. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have it for a contract. Sure. There's a little bit of that going on, but overall, there's been a lot flowing off of silver. Boom. Look at that line. Woo, right there. So again, metal's coming off. Talk about it every week. All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up pretty quick. What am I at right now on the I'm at 27 minutes? Let's do this real quick. Here's the deliveries. So the 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 last two business days of the month preceding the month you're going to take delivery. So the last two business days of November, if you want to take a physical delivery on the December contract, you can deliver your notice, your intent, saying, I'm gonna come get it. Short, you better deliver. And one of the conspiracy theories I had was, and, and this may be playing out, it's just a conspiracy theory. It's not confirmed, but it seems to be playing out was you're going to see a rise in the price of gold leading into December. Why? Because if the gold price rises, you have to put up more money to get a contract. In other words, that's a way to reduce the amount of gold coming off of COMEX. If, think about it for a minute. If gold's trading at 1950 and all of a sudden it goes to 2050, you got to pay $100 more for every ounce of gold in a 100 ounce gold contract to get it delivered on COMEX. Well, what happened at precisely the time that people are saying, I want delivery on COMEX? The price rises. And look at uh, November 29th through December 4th. Where did price go? The actual price, not deliveries. The price go from the 29th to the 4th. It went up and then down. What happened to deliveries? They went up. And as the price rose to take a delivery, the amount of delivery requests fell. Now, on in one hand, that's true every single, every single delivery month. There's only about six of them a year. And gold and silver, and they're different. December is the same, but the rest of them are different. It's just the way it trades, just the way it goes. Now, every month's a big physical delivery month. Well, and I said, I, I can see this in the data. This is when you stare at data all the time, you become such an egghead like me, you can see stuff. Okay. And <laughs> you just, you see, and it's not always true, but that's when I think came out. Like I said, I, I said, I bet we're going to get big deliveries the first couple of days in December. Boom, we did up to 11,000 contracts. 9,846 on November 29th, November 30th, the next to last business day, 1374. What I say? The first two business days before the trading month, you put your intent to deliver. The price rose during that time, making it more expensive. Now that most of the deliveries for December have shaken out and we're only getting, you know, a couple hundred the last couple of days, uh, the price fell. So was that on purpose? 
Was that the shorts on purpose saying, I've got to get the price up enough to stop the, the actual delivery so they don't get all the physical? And then once once that starts to peter out, I can let the price fall? Because you got a short cover. If, if the shorts are going to let it go long, they can lose money. It depends upon what position they're in, not only in futures, but the options market, whether they're in and out of the money on options and the time frame. So they can't keep it up all month. They can't let gold price rise all month. They got to smash it down after you tamp down the delivery requests. So as those delivery requests come down, you can tamp the price back down so that your shorts aren't out of the money, both in the futures and the options position. Make sense? Hopefully I'm making sense here. If you're a short on the COMEX, this is a paper short, and the price rises, you're in trouble. You may be upside down. You may have to pay that contract out. That's a lot of money, especially when you're the bullion banks and you've got like hundreds of thousands of these positions. You know, last time I looked, there were over 200,000 short contracts by the bullion banks in um, gold. And like, what was it, 40,000 in silver, something like that? Well, if people are going to come for a rush to deliver, you got to rise that price to make it to make it more expensive to deliver. Because think about it, if you're along and you are got to put up the money to take delivery, you're like, hey, I'm going to get some gold, baby. It's trading near 2000. I think it's going to go up. I'm going. And right before you, you put your intent to deliver, the price rises. Remember, for the first time ever, gold closed November over 2000 ever. Why? I said, because De December is a big delivery month. They want to tamp down the deliveries. And what happened after the delivery started to peter off, delivery request started to peter off after the first couple of last days of November and the first day of December, the price fell. Monday, big smash. Big open on Sunday night, big smash. They made it more expensive. They effectively stopped delivery notices and the price came down. Now, when the price came down, you saw then on December 4th, let's go back. On December 4th, they ticked up again. So people are saying, okay, we'll play that game. Look, on the 4th during the crash, well, people got twice as many as they did on the 1st. They went and said, okay, the crash, I want 540 more contracts. But it's not enough to concern the bullion banks. It's only 540. It's not 9,846. You see the patterns that make sense to you? What I'm saying? I called that ahead of time and I thought this is a conspiracy theory, but damn, it doesn't, it doesn't look like that's playing out now. It could be a coincidence of data. How many times do we see a quince of data in the precious metal derivative markets? Like, how many times have we looked at this and it's constantly a coincidence? Well, it just happened to happen that way. I don't know, man. I could be wrong on that. I could be right. But it looks like it played out like it called a few days before. Who the hell knows? All right. Uh, Thursday, we're going to talk about CBDC system. Central Bank Digital Currency. And this is a culmination of, I'm going to take two minutes, I promise, two minutes on this. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to set it up. This is the setup. So the last few years, I've been talking about Basel III liquidity requirements. I've been talking about the corruption in the gold and silver market. I've been talking about the inability of the CFTC to regulate it. I've had interviews. Uh, Silver's Imposing put three videos out on that of the guy that used to be in, you know, in charge of the investigations, or so he said. And it seemed to be when I did my research, that was true. Uh, I did three videos on that. We've covered a lot of what's going on. We covered the Perth Mint scandal and the rehab of uh, people's gold to some third party S&P size counterparty, which could have been an exchange or another mint or somebody big that's an S&P rated, a government. Then we covered uh, with the help of Bix doing that research. I think it was Jack Sermon. It, it came out and said they're artificially limiting the amount of eagles. We talked about the eagle market and artificially limiting that and putting people into other products to ostensibly some uh, reduce the demand of American silver eagles, but also to make more money for the mint or whoever, whoever they're working with. We cover a lot of those topics. Um, this is where the culmination of that. We're going to get back into the money side. We're going to get back into the currency side of this. And it's really going to be kind of a capstone, if you will. In academics, they call capstone sort of your final class that takes and in, incorporates all the other things. And in, in my bachelor's degree, it was international business. That was my capstone. We took finance and economics and even the tech classes I have because it's a hybrid degree. And we talked about international business. That was our capstone. We had to use all the stuff we learned before and put it into a big picture view of what's going on in the world. Well, that's what I'm going to do here. That doesn't mean it's going to end my channel or end you know, what I talk about, but it's going to be maybe not the ultimate series of videos I do because I think that will come out when the big changes come, when the economy crashes, 
and then we get into the new system, that will be the ultimate series of videos as, as I'm here during that and we're talking about that. This will be the penultimate. This will be the setup for the crash and introduction of the new system. And in this penultimate series, I'm going to talk about what the new system looks like. And I have some friends kind of help me with this. I've been super busy with the store. I put this off for about a month, but I got to do it. I got to do it before the end of the year. Heading into January 1, I'm going to get you all updated on this stuff. I promise, I promise. And it'll start Thursday. I don't know how many videos I'm going to do yet. I'm not all the way through everything. I tend to sit down and just absorb myself into it. I may actually take a day off tomorrow and just do nothing but, you know, finalize the first part of the video. Anyway, we'll figure it out. It'll start Thursday. It'll be interesting. I'm going to dive in it like only I can. We're going along. It's 35 minutes. And I got one last thing to do. I've got to show you some kick-ass new products I got in the store. You guys are going to like this. You actually voted on one in Twitter and in YouTube community polls. So I got it. I finally got it. My friend made them. I got them. Yes. But I also got some other cool stuff I picked up, and you guys are going to want to see it. And I've got them locally, and I can get more. So if you guys want more, I can get more. I start off with small lots. We'll see what happens. But I'm going to be right back with those silver products. They're all silver, and they're cool. Stay tuned. Be right back. All right, last two things. Uh, we're going to talk about new products I have in the store. You guys voted on this one. We put out a poll probably a month or two ago. What would you guys like to see? Uh, dice, Shape of Texas, uh, trading cards, whatever, in silver. Well, I have the dice now. So you can see here, I've got a couple of them. I've only got 10 of these in stock. They're made by a friend of mine who's a metal worker. One and one half ounces we'll have in the store for $76. That's with, you know, credit card charges in the store, 75, uh, 76 bucks custom can't get them anywhere else. Just like this one and a half ounces, really just gorgeous, beautiful dice. I've already had people reach out to me. This will be in the store by the time this video comes out. These will get sold that quick. I only have 10 now. I've got 10 more on the way. I'm going to keep ordering these as many as I can to keep them in stock. Another cool thing I got for the holidays is this 10 ounce holiday. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, what was it? pentagram six sides whatever it is uh gorgeous 10 ounces of 999 pure silver made by a refinery near me these are absolutely gorgeous if you want a holiday gift i've only got a couple of these in stock we'll have those out and also for you guys uh that like guns i have a couple of bullets this is a bullet molded on a 380 shell you can see it's got the the catch here bullet here cartridge it's really cool it's got some writing on the end let's see if i can get that to focus any case really cool these are one ounce of pure silver, and also I've got shotgun shells. Even got the little <laughs> simulated. Um, anyway, and you, you know, on the bottom you've got the writing, you've got the cartridge, then you've got the, uh, you know, the softer, you know, wrapped part of it. I don't know what they call that a shotgun shell. I used to make these when I was a kid. We used to make our own slug shells. We would take the pebbles out, put the the gunpowder and stuff back in and put a slug in there. Uh, my older brother taught me how to do it when we went hunting. So we didn't have to buy the slug rounds are more expensive. He would put like a ball or a slug in here and we'd make our own. Um, in any case, I don't know what the parts are, but I've, I've made these before, but that's a five ouncer. That is a five ounce silver shotgun shell, one ounce bullet, one and one half, half ounce dice, six sided dice. And you actually roll with these if you want, although being silver, I probably wouldn't. And a 10 ounce holiday round or holiday bar. Now, we do have one ounce holiday rounds already in the store that are a similar design, but I also have this on one side. And it, oops, a snowman on the other. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we have those all in the store if you're interested. Now, last, very last thing, and I haven't uh, put this up lately. It's been running on Twitter, but I wanted to share screen on donations. So we now have two bills in the state of Florida for voting on gold and silver sound money. Let me state that again. There are two bills. They have bill numbers they got yesterday. They're going to committee and then going to vote on making gold and silver, I'm sorry, gold, uh, money, legal tender of the land and creating a depository in the state of Florida. This is huge. Florida is huge. If we get this in Florida, it's already in four other states. This would be the fifth state to explicitly at the state level say, we're using gold as sound money and to create, you know, and this one will create a depository and open up the option later on for blockchain for the ability to the blockchain to help manage that you can either do physical or blockchain or both but in this case it establishes gold as money so i have this donor box link you can see it right here the url at the top i'll put it in the description please consider donating the goal is twenty thousand monthly hiring full-time lobbyists to get this through costs about 10 grand a month plus we have people working for citizens for sound money a nonprofit doing this and they need money to continue doing this because after florida there's four other states there's texas where i live there's new hampshire south carolina and more 
And we're also working with sister groups doing this in other states. We're trying to do this to where gold is money. If you have gold and silver and you want to be able to spend them as money when the central bank digital currency system comes, which is my next set of videos on Thursday, please consider donating. You can click, click, simply click on one of these links. Now, I'm doing a giveaway. Oh, by the way, this is Daniel with a Speaker of the House in Florida, Paul Renner, and a legislative dinner with 30 Florida senators. He's done the work, yeoman's work, to where the governor's office is in favor of this bill. Both uh, um, House of the Legislature are in favor of this. We, he thinks a 90% chance this will pass. He said this on our Monday Spaces before. It's got the two bills have been created in Florida. It's going to get voted on. It's in committee. It's going to committee. Uh, but we need money to help do this in Florida and beyond. And if you if you want gold and silver to actually be money again, we have to do it at the state level to protect citizens in those states from doing it. Because if you don't, you don't have protections. And the feds could say, ah, you're not supposed to use that as money. You can technically barter with it, you can't use it as money. We're using as money, 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 money. And in the bill, it's talking about valuing it at market rates, not at face value rates. You know, not at 20 or 50 or whatever it says on the coin, but at market rates. Important. All right. Now. Join me in supporting it. For those who give $250, if you click on, you know, $250 button here or just put a custom amount 250, I'm going to send you a one ounce silverback crystal metal round for the first 20 people. So you get some silver out of it. And if you think silver is going up, that mitigates a lot of your investment. But if you don't donate to this and we don't get it passed in the States, gold and silver may never become money again, or at least gold will never become money again. And you may not get the full benefit of it. This is protecting the purchasing power of your gold and silver and it's protecting uh, against the purchasing power collapse of the dollar. So it's protecting your investments as well as donating to this great cause. The first 10 people will donate $500 or more. They're going to get a five ounce bar. This is a five ounce bar with an eagle on it from Eagle Forge. Boy, my friend makes these. These are really cool poured bars. You're not going to get this anywhere else in the country. I'm the only one online that sells them, I believe. There are a few local dealers that sell them here in Dallas for Worth. I'm the only one online. You can get these online. That's about, you know, no, what is that? $140 worth of silver, or whatever the case may be, five ounces. It's $130 worth. Plus, you're always going to play a little bit of a markup. That, that's that's free to you if you donate 500 So so the first 20 people, 250 get a round. First 10 people, 500 get one of these. This is just coming out of my pocket. This is my contribution. Please consider donating. It's a good cause. If we can get this in Florida, we think it'll start a cascade across the rest of the union. It would be the fifth state and the biggest state. We think it would push forward Texas into doing this because Texas has a bullion depository. Texas would be like, uh, okay, Florida actually made it money. Maybe we need to consider that. There's been movements in Texas, but they've stopped. This may get it over the line in Texas. Think about if you have Florida and Texas and four other states, what comes next? Who falls after that? After that, South Carolina, New Hampshire, which we're looking at, will probably go, time, baby, let's go. The smaller states sometimes don't want to leave, but you get a big one leading, the smaller dogs will come back. And then you've got a block of states, big ones. And we want this to come to a state near you to protect you so that you can use this and gold. Make it money again. Counteract the effect of CBDCs and the fall of the dollar. Remember Thursday, we're talking about that. The fall of the dollar, the rise of the CBDCs. Once you see that video, you may be more willing to both uh, help us out on the campaign and on the lobbying to get gold as money again. And also to say, maybe it's time for me to invest in precious metals again. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. Thank you, guys. It's been your weekly market wrap. This went way longer than I thought. But stay tuned to Thursday. Great video for you there. Till next time, Rob Keats, goldsoverpros.com.